Welcome back to the Swamp 24-7 Podcast. I'm Thomas Goldcamp here with Blake Alderman coming at you with another edition of the Swamp 24-7 Podcast. Blake, first things first, we've talked Florida recruiting quite a bit. You know, June was a busy month for Florida. 2022 class kind of still a work in progress, but Florida now has its first commitment for 2023. Why don't you go ahead and explain who this commitment is, what it means to Florida, and kind of how the Gators are getting the 2023 class off to a start. Yeah, you know, it's always good to start off with a composite top 100 guy, and Florida landed one of those on uh, on on Tuesday with uh, with Mac Markway. He's a 2023 tight end um, out of the St. Louis, Missouri area. First guy from St. Louis that's committed to Florida, at least off the top of my head, since I've covered recruiting. So that was the first for me to check off that box. But I mean, this is a it's a good commitment for the first one in the class. Um, he's a six foot four, 250 pound tight end. And it's interesting, you know, from Steve Wilfong talking with him, 24-7 sports recruiting director, he actually spoke with Mac and his father um, about, you know, just the, the conversations with Florida, what kind of led to things. And, and Tim Brewster, Florida's tight ends coach, was the big catalyst here. You know, great relationship there. Um, Mark Way has really pointed to him and in his opinion and people he's talked to as Brewster being the best tight end coach in college football, um, having coached two uh, Mackey Award winners at the tight end position. And I think one of the interesting things that really sold him was that Brewster really compared him as a mix, a mix between Nick O'Leary and Kyle Pitts. So he has the size, but he also has the athleticism. And from talking with Mark Way in the past, after a visit to Florida, he took it in a, a June 25th. Um, he said that <clears throat> the thing that Florida liked the most about him was he's that a, he's a guy that they can work around on the field. He has the size to block. He has the athleticism to catch. So it's not a deal to where – you know, you have you put in a guy that's more of a pass catching tight end, but he's not a blocker, so you have to move him in and out and move these kind of pieces. So I think that this is a really good mismatch type guy for Florida. Having someone who's athletic and can catch the football and put him in different positions to mismatch, like what this uh, coaching staff does a really good job of doing. But you also have a guy that's coming in with that size that can help in the blocking game. And you know, everyone knows that Florida has struggled in the run game. Um, really sealing the edge. And I know that Kyle Pitts, obviously he really improved his blocking game from his junior year to his senior right. year, but you have a guy now with that size that's coming in as a freshman or sophomore. That is a guy that you, you would think has a little bit more of a fast pass in that regard. So, you know, really good get for Florida, really good start off to that 2023 class. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, the blocking aspect isn't something that Kyle Pitts really came to Florida with. You know, if you remember back to his freshman year, <laughs> Kyle Pitts actually started off practicing with the wide receivers with Van Jefferson and those guys. And, uh, you know, really even in his sophomore year, wasn't a great blocker. Florida, I think, you know, kind of missed that. And it wasn't until last year when Kyle Pitts really added that to his game that you saw, you know, him start to flourish and really become that high end uh, tight end. Blake, how, how does a guy like Mac Markway compare with, uh, you know, a 2022 guy like Jaleel Skinner, who's a, a guy that I know that Florida fans kind of had their eye on for a while. Seems like maybe he's cooled on Florida a little bit. How do their games kind of compare? You know, I think they're apples to oranges. I think Jaleel is one of those guys in the fit of more of a, I don't think he's he's he, obviously it's it's hard to say someone is like Kyle Pitts because that's a generational talent. You know, sure. that's a that's a guy that you probably won't see many guys play of, but he's that same build to where I think you're gonna see him come in and 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 be that guy that struggles in the blocking game coming out. That's a guy that's probably put out as wide receiver. And if his frame doesn't grow any bigger, I think he's a guy that could stay as a wide receiver. And, you know, that's one thing that Florida State is a 24-7 sports crystal ball uh, leader for Jaleel Skinner. And I think that the fact that they're pitching him as more of a wide receiver role, I think that's something that he's into. And honestly, I think it's something that fits him better because he is going to take some time to add that bulk. So I think that Markway... And Skinner are apples to oranges just because you have a guy that's coming in with that kind of size that Mark Way does. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. I think Jalil is very athletic. I think that he's a, a mismatched guy in the passing game. But I just don't think he has that blocking regard, help in the run game type type of skill set that Mark uh, that Mac Markway has. So they're a little different, but I, I think they're both really good players. You know, I, I think that, you know, both of those guys were guys that Florida wanted. Um, obviously, Jalil Skinner. Just really did, like you said, seem to cool on Florida. He's he's eliminated them from his top five. So that's a guy that I, I see moving on. And, and Florida's obviously still looking at a guy like Mason Taylor in the 2022 class. They have C.J. Hawkins already committed to that tight end position. Right. We'll Another see how things guy, right? unfold. Yeah, exactly. That's a guy that I think is a diamond in the rough guy. First year playing football last year was more of a basketball guy. That's another guy that's not afraid to put his nose in there and block. Um, he's shown some pass catching abilities. Mason Taylor is another guy that Florida is still kicking the tires on. He's a target there, but I wouldn't be surprised if Florida really is done at tight end for the 22 class. We'll see how things play out with Mason Taylor, but I think that Florida in general, you know, you landed two guys in the 21 class. 
and Nick Elsness um, and Gage Wilcox. You have C.J. Hawkins committed to the 22 class. You have Mac Markway now committed to 2023. So I think Florida could use those needs in that 2022 class for you know maybe an extra wide receiver or just another position in general. So I really like how the tight end room is shaping up for the future. Yeah, I'm with you there. I think I think when you land a guy in 2023 like a Mac Markway, a top 24/7 guy. Like you said, it, it lessens the need for you to take another tight end a la, you know, a Jaleel Skinner. And, and Blake, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if Jaleel ever came out and said this explicitly, but it seemed like the vibe was that he didn't necessarily want to be compared to Kyle Pitts, you know, kind of wanted to be his own player. And and in fairness, that's a tough bar to live up to, you know, to live up to Kyle Pitts. D- does Markway kind of, do you think, embrace that as a, as a challenge or see that as, you know, maybe his platform to take that step to the next level? Well, you know, I think that it's something that it's not being the next Kyle Pitts. I think it's something to where the usage of the tight end for Mark okay. Mac for Mac Markway. I I've called this guy Mark all week, so excuse me. Sorry. Hey, say it five times fast, and I'll be impressed. Mac Markway is, I think, a guy that he's interested more so in learning under a guy like Brewster. I think the fact that they make that a focal position for him. I mean, this is a guy in his commitment editor that had old pictures of you know. Florida tight ends. He had Cornelius Ingram. He had, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jordan Reed. He had Kyle Pitts in these pictures. So I think he th- is a guy that's going to thrive on that history that guys have had coming out of Florida at that tight end position. So, you know, I don't know that it's something that it, it, it is tough, like you said, to compare someone that you're going to be the next Kyle Pitts. But I think what Florida's pitch was just the fact that Skinner had that same skill set to where that they're going to use him in that same aspect. So, I think that in general, Jaleel Skinner, you look at Florida's tight end room, I think he's, and you look at the schools that he's really looking at right now, a lot of the schools are really looking for a guy that's going to come in and compete right away. So I think mm-hmm. that that was something that was more so than anything with, with Skinner. All right, Blake, that's 2023. Let's focus on 2022. Florida, maybe not the most impressive recruiting class on paper right now. You look at it, they're ranked 34th nationally, 11th in the SEC. Obviously, that's not good enough. Obviously, the class isn't finished yet. You know, Early in June, we talked about Florida getting a lot of those big name visitors on campus. There was a lot of buzz. Haven't really seen the follow through on that buzz yet. But Blake, obviously, Friday Night Lights is always a big event for Florida coming up this week. Where does Florida stand going into that? What are the things that fans need to be looking for? And is this a a chance for Florida to maybe capture a little bit more of that momentum heading into fall camp, heading into the season when they'll be able to get guys on campus for actual football games? Well, it should be because now that the season is starting, Florida's coaching staff is going to obviously be busy with their own season. A lot of these high school guys are going to be starting fall camp. Some of these guys have wanted to have decisions late July, early August. Some of these guys already have commitment dates set. So this is a time for Florida to carry some momentum into the season. You want to try to get this last hurrah. The whole month of July, except for this last week that you know started basically Sunday, was a dead period. So now you have a chance to get some more of these guys on campus for that last chance. Um so, you know, I think that this is a chance for Florida to really make an impression and they're going to have a lot of guys on campus. Friday Night Lights in general has turned into a glorified 2023 scouting camp type of event. It seems so like it's been that way for a couple of years. It, it has been that know. way for a couple of years and it's been that way since before Dan Mullen was here. It's right. a chance to get the next crop up, to have them really come work out, show the staff what they can do. Um, you know, you have some 2022 guys that come in, but for the most part, those guys come and hang out, which is great. Um, something different this year that Florida is bringing in there is that obviously the next day on Saturday, they're having a cookout. So Relationship ribs. I hope I get some, I'm going to be there. So I'm going to be, you're going to hear me out there begging for ribs. If you, if you're in Gainesville. Um, so I, I think that's a chance to get some of these guys on campus. Some of the guys that I'm really keeping an eye on um, f- uh, three-star wide receiver, uh, Jalen Glover, he's already set at a commitment date for August 6th. So I don't expect any kind of fireworks or anything like that on the visit itself. But I do think that Florida is trending in his recruitment. That's going to be the last visit that he takes before that decision date. He's really been into Florida. I mean, this is a guy that's already taken all five of his official visits in June, was planning to commit after those visits. Well, then Florida offered. So he wanted to get back for a, uh, for a visit with his family. So he's going to get a chance to do that. Another offensive tackle from the in, uh, from the uh, inner central part of Florida, Leighton Nelson. Um, he's a guy that landed an offer from Florida in June after camping a couple times. Um, so I think that that's a guy that I, I feel is trending Florida. I already have a 24-7 sports crystal ball in for him. Some other guys on the offensive line that I'm interested in seeing, I don't know that they're necessarily trending towards Florida, but it's a chance to get these guys on campus. Jacob Hood, uh, Eston Harris, Elijah Zolikoffer. These are guys that haven't visited Florida in a while or haven't visited Florida at all. You know, for guys like Jacob Hood and Eston Harris Jr., they have never visited Florida before. Florida offered them in late June. So this is a chance to get them on campus, really try to make an impact because Florida's offensive line board, they've had to offer a lot of new guys in the month of June. A lot of those upper crust target guys either committed elsewhere or trending elsewhere. So Florida's really trying to put their board back together. 
Um, but as far as guys that I'm, you know, continuing on guys that I'm watching, three-star linebacker EJ Lightsey, been on Florida's campus twice in June, has named Florida his leader. Um, I think that Florida's really sitting in a good spot there for him. Uh, 2023 guy, Raymond Cottrell. Um, he's already named Florida's leader. There is dream school. It's a, you know, school that he grew up watching and really wanted that offer. So I think that that's one guy that I'm keeping an eye on as well. Um, so those are some guys that I would say are worth keeping an eye on for Friday night lights. Those are the kind of the storyline guys that I'm keeping an eye on, but you know, another guy too, that, you know, I think that Florida's in a good spot for, I do think that it is Florida and LSU battling it out for him is Azaria Thomas. He's a defensive back from the Niceville area up in the panhandle. <clears throat> Took official visits, Georgia Tech, Florida, LSU in the month of June. That's his final three schools. LSU was the team that was kind of getting some buzz coming out of that official visit there. So Florida's turning around and getting him on campus for two days. He'll be there Friday. He'll be there Saturday. So it's a chance for Florida to make that last that lasting impact for him for a guy who's trying to make a commitment in August. So I think that this is a big visit on deck for Florida. Like, are you expecting commitments from this weekend? I know uh, last year, obviously, we didn't have Friday Night Lights. And I want to say the year before, uh, I tried to pull it up as you were talking there, but uh, I don't think there were any commitments the year before. So it's been a couple of years. Friday Night Lights has been a little quiet. Are, are you expecting some movement in terms of the commitment front? A lot of those guys that I mentioned, you know, like the Leighton Nelsons, um, the EJ Lightsies, those are guys, Raymond Cottrell are guys that I have on commitment watch. Another guy, too, is four-star running back Terrence Gibbs. He's had Florida as his leader for – Uh, almost two months now. So I think that's the guy that I'm keeping an eye on because he's making another visit to Florida. Um, He's told uh, 24 seven sports Cole Fulton that he is going to make a decision sometime in the month of July. We're running a little late on that. You know, we're running out of days there. So I think that if it isn't sometime this month, it is August as it is, it's whatever it is. I do think that Florida is the, the, the smart pick for him right now. Um, You know, so I think that those guys, you know, the Gibbs, um, the Nelsons, uh, the Cottrell's and the, the, uh, Light sees are the guys that I'm really keeping the closest eye on right now. All right. Well, there you have it. Blake will be out there at Friday Night Lights on Friday. Uh, I believe Cole Taylor, our intern, will also be there. And I think you said Andrew Evans is also going to be there. Yep. They'll all be there. So we'll have a big team out there for 24 7 sports. I'll kind of be coordinating from home. Uh, so you guys know the drill. If you've been around Swamp 24 7, hit up swamp247.com. We'll have updates throughout the day. We'll have a central page where you can kind of go to see all of Blake's posts on the message board as guys arrive, as he starts to talk to them, kind of gauge where they're feeling. Uh, so be sure to check that out. If you're not a VIP subscriber, now's the time. Friday Night Lights is one of our busiest days of the year, and and Blake and his team do an absolutely excellent job of covering it. Uh, Blake, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back on the other side. I know we got a lot of news. We talked a little bit of Oklahoma, Texas on the last episode of the podcast. We have a lot more details on that now and how things are shaping up in the SEC. So we'll be back after a quick break. <clears throat> Welcome back to the Swamp 24-7 podcast. I'm Thomas Goldcamp here with Blake Alderman. Blake, we talked about it a little bit on the last episode of the show. I think we shot the podcast on Thursday, and I want to say it was Wednesday, maybe at SEC Media Days, where the news about Oklahoma and Texas having reached out to the SEC about possibly joining the league came out. It was very fresh last week. I think now that we've seen things unfold a little bit, we have a much better idea. This seems pretty real at this point, you know, officially at this point. Texas and Oklahoma have notified the Big 12 that they plan to leave when their grant of rights is up in 2025. Now, a lot of that seems like legal posturing right now. There's very much, I think, the possibility that both Oklahoma and Texas could come and begin play in the SEC before 2025. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of moving pieces, a lot of dominoes that have to fall, you know, as as the remaining teams in the Big 12 kind of figure out, uh uh-oh, we just lost two of our powerhouses. What does that mean for the league? What does that mean for the TV money we're going to get down the road? Uh, Does the Big 12 go and then try to poach some schools from the Pac-12 or, um, you know, some of these smaller conferences? That's all TBD, Blake. I think at the end of the day, though, this seems very concrete. Oklahoma and Texas are going to be part of the SEC. Uh, We talked a little bit about how that's going to make things a little bit tougher. Um, Now that you've had a week to kind of let this ruminate a little bit, where do you stand on, on these additions? What does it mean for, I guess, the league as a whole, adding these two programs? I think I'm, I'm kind of in the same spot. I think that it still makes it obviously tougher. It's just adding two more teams into the mix. I'm really interested in this pod, you know, having the pod set up for the games. I think that if they do it to where there's a pod set up, I'm more interested in that because I feel like a lot of these guys, you just ha- you see so many of these teams that play the same guys. You know, they don't really mix and match things. So I think if you're adding those teams in there, the, the selfish side of me, the college football fan side of me, wants to see these different types of games. You know, you want to see Florida play Texas. You want to yes. see them play Oklahoma. You want to see them play all these other kind of teams. 
So I think now that it's looking more realistic, I think that it's time to be more realistic about talking about the pod setup and kind of breaking up this, you know, just the East and the West type of situation there. Because I do think it's very doable. I've seen a lot of the, you know, mock systems of what it would be if they have the pods. And I think geographically, a lot of those things set up, you know, I've seen one that I believe it was Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, and somebody Kentucky, else I think. and Kentucky, something like that was in one of them. And I, I think that that's good, you know, because I think you still get the Florida Georgia game. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, you're still going to play some of these other teams in there too and mix and match. So I really like how they're set up geographically because I think that it really makes a lot of sense, you know? Um, but for me, I just, I think it makes it tougher, but you know, now it seems like, you know, A&M is kind of, you know, salty a little bit about you know not being i believe like being super consulted about these kind of things yeah. so now it sounds I'm, like I'm they were left in the dark i'm wondering what the fallout is going to be of the, you know adding them in there because i do think that the sec has a lot of good teams and i think just in general from top to bottom you know a&m is obviously a great team to have in there and i i just i don't want to mess up a good thing that's already there by adding something if that makes sense no and i think that's where a lot of people stand and one of the most uh common i think concerns from fans, especially on the Swamp 24-7 message board, as we've kind of talked about this, is Texas is a program that has very, very deep pockets, right? They've got a lot of booster money. They have a lot of sway. Texas has kind of pushed the Big 12 around in terms of what that league does and kind of strong-armed them at various points, whether it's the Longhorn Network or kind of asserting their influence. And I think a lot of fans have concern that, you know, if they take Texas – they try to do that same kind of thing in the SEC. I, I don't think I'm as worried about that. I think that, you know, the core of the SEC, those power programs that have been around for a long time, will kind of continue to have each other's backs for the most part when it comes to what would be really an outsider in Texas and OU. Um, I guess the bigger concern for me, and, and we talked about it a little bit on the last episode of the podcast, where does Florida kind of fall out when you add two teams that are, you know, Texas not really a playoff contender right now, but certainly has that potential. And they can recruit on the level of Florida – uh, they can recruit on the level of of a Georgia or Alabama when they really get things rolling. That hasn't been the case lately, but they certainly have that potential. Where does Florida fall if you do end up going to, say, a pod system where you have, you know, Florida's playing now Georgia every year, and then you play two teams from each of these other four pods every year? That means you're going to have a pretty high likelihood of playing a schedule that includes maybe a Georgia, uh, an Alabama, an Auburn, an LSU, a Texas A&M, a Texas, or an Oklahoma, where you're going to get three to four of those games against those teams I just mentioned every year. How does that end up shaking out? Does Florida have the talent to stand up to that, which I think is a big question mark in recruiting right now. And then do they have the commitment from the administration to be able to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak? And I think, you know, Florida's obviously pouring a lot of money into facilities. I think that's a good thing. Um, But if there is a question mark for me, it's that. And I think you're talking about right now, the way the SEC is set up, Florida really, for the most part, really just has to get by Georgia. You get by Georgia, you're in the SEC title game, anything can happen in that one game. And we saw that last year, Florida six points away from Alabama. Um, when you start adding more of those big hurdles, like a Georgia, an Oklahoma, and now you got a Texas potentially on the schedule, I think that's where things get tougher. And Blake, I think 2021 is going to be an excellent year to kind of gauge what that may look like for Florida, because you've got Alabama on the schedule. And, you know, I think that's going to be an awesome game, you know, to see what Florida's really made of, whether or not what Dan Mullen's doing right now at Florida is sustainable. You know, I know that Florida's replacing a lot. They've got a new quarterback. They've got question marks on offense. Got to fix the defense. But, I mean, Alabama has some question marks too, Blake. And uh, I think when I look at it, you know, I think this this 2021 schedule with Alabama and with a Georgia on it, with an LSU – you know, if Oklahoma and Texas get added to the league, you can pretty much bank on playing a schedule that's similar to that every single year. You know, and as a college football fan, that's exciting, you know, but I get it from, uh, you know, like like Florida's schedule set up this year, obviously, like the end, you won't have those years to where, or more than likely won't have those years to end where, you know, you have the bulkier games at the beginning or the end of the season. It's going to be pretty consistent all along. Right. So, I, I mean, I'm all for it, and you even see Florida starting to add some more of these, you know, out of conference types of games. That makes that just that much harder because Florida's adding, you know, they're not playing off with, you know, East Texas, you know, Community College Central. You know, you're not seeing those kind of teams on there on the schedule anymore. Yeah. You're seeing a lot tougher there. So I think you have a good point because between the out of conference schedules and, you know, a tougher SEC schedule, you know, Florida's not going to have those years to where, you know, fans are like, man, the schedule sets up for a run, blah, 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 this kind of thing, because it's going to be tough every year. And I love that we're going to see it early this year with that Alabama game, man. I mean, 
Uh, I know that Florida's kind of had the short end of the stick against Alabama the last several times. What is it? 2020, 2016, 2015, 2011, 2010, 2009. You got to go all the way back to 2008 for the last Florida win against Alabama. So I think the Gators have a lot to prove. Uh, Blake, I'll, I'll go ahead and give Florida the secret to this Alabama game. Wear the 2006 throwback jerseys. Those are, in my opinion, hands down the best throwbacks that Florida has worn. Uh, Blake, speaking of throwbacks, uh, we have a, a special promotion that 24-7 Sports is working with, uh, with Home Field Apparel. Home Field Apparel, if you're not aware of it, guys, is the premium college apparel brand. Uh, what they do is they take a lot of old school vintage looks, uh, vintage logos. I know um, they've got like the Charlie Pell logo, and they officially license it via the school and then put out a big product line. Blake, one of the things that they've been doing is this big new Saturday promotion where every Saturday they launch a new team's apparel line. Well, guess what? July 31st at noon, the Florida apparel line comes out. It's going to be awesome, Blake. You and I have both had a chance to look at some of the designs. Uh, I'm pulling them up right now in front of me. Uh, absolutely some, just some awesome t-shirts, some hoodies. Uh, you've got old school UF logos. You've got the Charlie Pell logo, uh, old school Albert. It's going to be really awesome, guys. Uh, so we actually are offering you guys a discount on these home field apparel uh, designs that are going to be launched uh, on July 31st at noon. Uh, there's 14 different pieces of apparel, t-shirts, hoodies, all that kind of things. And new customers can get 15% off of their first purchase from Homefield with the code SWAMP247 at checkout. Be sure to hit homefieldapparel.com on July 31st at noon. I'm telling you guys, you're not going to want to miss this lineup. It looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've had some of the gear sent to us. It's, it's extremely comfortable. It, you don't want to miss it. So be sure to check that out. Blake, let's talk about fall camp. Fall camp starts next week. I know that we've talked about Friday Night Lights, and obviously for the next couple days, our focus will be there. The Orlando Sentinel put out a piece, I think in the last day or two, talking about Florida's offseason program. They had a chance to speak with Emory Jones. And one thing that stuck out to me right away when reading this article was that Emory Jones is working out with his receivers six times a week, trying to get timing down, all that. I, I could not be more thrilled to hear that, uh, you know, from the standpoint that I think what that shows to me is that he's soaked up a lot of what Kyle Trask kind of did. Because if you look at Kyle Trask, you can't fake the kind of timing that he had with his receivers. Blake, uh, I guess how bullish are you, uh, you know, how positive are you on the outlook for Emory Jones heading into 2021? You know, I think that just the setup that he has, being able to use his legs, I think you're going to see a lot of guys really key on that. So I think getting the timing down, with his receivers, I think is going to be good because I think whenever you start to see some of these guys kind of cheat down a little bit, you know, think that he's going to run it. I think that you're going to find little mismatches and different things opening up. So I think learning his timing from his wide receivers is going to be good. And I say that it's going to be good because he, he brings that different dynamic to the team, but also Florida's going to have so many new receivers, you know? Right. Yeah. I'm sure he's worked a lot with obviously Jacob Copeland. He's worked with a lot, you know, Justin shorter from, Emory being that number two type of guy, I'm sure he's worked and got a lot of second team reps to a lot of these guys. But now these guys are going to be getting a lot more reps. They're going to be spending a lot more time around each other. There's not going to be as much rotation, you know, whenever Emory jumps in with the ones and all that. So I think anytime you can get that timing is great. And I think that being that type of leader is exactly what Florida needs. You know, obviously Kyle Trask, he was a guy that I think was more of a lead by example type of guy. You know, sure, he organized a lot of things, a lot of workouts with a lot of players. But I think Emory is a little bit more vocal. You know, I don't think he's the most outspoken person in the world, but I think that you're seeing him have that different dynamic of being more of a leader and being more vocal and obviously trying to put the, you know, the, the preparation to things too and being a leader in that aspect too. So I think it's really good for Florida's offense because, you know, when we talked, it was either the last podcast or a couple podcasts in the past. Who's going to be that guy that steps up for Florida? Who's going to be that guy that takes charge for the season? You know, is kind of the guy that, you know, maybe we're not talking about the season that, you know, has that kind of jump into a year where it's a big year and then everyone starts talking about him. So I think that that type of thing with so many different pieces, I think is going to be good for Florida's timing because, you know, the offensive line, there can be breakdowns with the different running quarterbacks. So if your receivers are that much more comfortable with you, I think that's all, all the better. And I think that that's what those types of workouts are going to bring. Well, and I think that's really the only way that you can kind of build that rapport is to kind of continually do it throughout the off season. Um, Blake, I asked on the Swamp 24-7 message boards uh, a couple days ago, I put some polls up in terms of who will, you know, kind of be Florida's statistical leaders in the fall. And I, I don't think it's any surprise. Everybody expects, you know, Emory Jones to be Florida's leading passer. About 90% of the votes uh, with about probably, I don't know, 400 votes or so came in. Emory Jones is going to lead Florida in passing. I think some of the more interesting results come when you ask about Florida's leading rusher. 
Emory Jones was also voted to be Florida's leading rusher. Now it's narrow. He got 31% of the votes compared to uh, about 30% for Damian Pierce. I guess, did you answer in those polls at all? I didn't. Okay. What, what do you think? Who, who would your pick for Florida's leading rusher be this fall? I think it's going to be Emory Jones, but I do think that it's very close between Damian Pierce because I think Florida has such a committee at running back that obviously they're going to split a lot of reps between guys. I mean, you've got Naquan Wright, you know, Bowman, Lingard, you know, Malik Davis, all those types of guys. But I think that with Emory Jones, I think you're going to see Florida get back to more of that bread and butter, running him, trying to open different things in the passing game. You know, he's obviously very electric and can move really well. So I think that the the running quarterback type of dynamic in Florida's offense, or excuse me, from Dan Mullen's type of offense, he's running in the past I think that that's gonna be more apparent this year and I think whenever you have a guy like Damian Pierce who's a little bit more of a bruiser you know Emory Jones yeah he has that speed he can you know break through the line and and, you know be kind of gone and and, you know in a snap of your fingers but I think that having that type of bully type of running that Damian Pierce brings I think that that's why he'd be my next guy you know for how close that was I think that's how close I would be with my own opinion yeah, I mean, I and I think nobody knows, and I think that's what's going to be fascinating about fall camp. You know, we don't know yet exactly the exact start date or exactly whether or not the media is going to be able to be out there to see. And I'm sure even if the media is out there for a couple practices, Dan Mullen's not going to show his hand. But Blake, we, we talked get to about see it. some guys do jumping jacks. Yeah, we'll get to see some jumping jacks. We'll get to see the guys working out in the pit, aka the guys that are injured. But uh, you know, kickers, maybe we'll see some of them. Um, but no, I, I'm really curious to see, you know, personnel wise, how much Florida changes it up. You know, we've talked about having to replace a lot at receiver. I think one of the ways you can kind of overcome that is play multiple tight end sets, play two back sets. And, you know, that's not something that we've typically seen Dan Mullen's teams do a whole lot. I think there was one year at Mississippi State, if I if I remember correctly, where they, they did employ a lot of two back stuff. But I think it's going to be a very different look for Florida. And so, you know, I can't wait for the start of fall camp. Friday Night Lights, you know, SEC Media Days last week. That kind of, it starts to set in that the season is, is right around the corner. Um, you know, obviously still a kind of a different year with, you know, who knows how the COVID protocols are going to shake out and all that. But Blake, I'm excited to get back to it. I know that you're excited. Maybe dreading Friday Night Lights a little bit. I know that's a super long day. Um, if I get some ribs on Saturday, it'll be all worth it. There you go. You heard it there. Shannon Snell, uh, you're on deck. <laughs> but all right, guys, that'll do it for us today. Uh, once again, don't forget about that home, home field apparel lineup that is launching on July 31st at noon. Uh, new customers, 15% off of your first purchase with the code SWAMP247 at checkout. So homefieldapparel.com, guys. Be sure to hit it up on July 31st at noon. That'll do it for this episode of the Swamp 24-7 Podcast. I'm Thomas Goldcamp. He's Blake Alderman. We'll be back next week with more.